Hey, friends and clients. I am Jennifer Walker Gates, immigration attorney. I am here this morning with my colleague on our of counsel uh, immigration attorney, employment based immigration attorney, Matthew Myers. Hey, Matthew. Hi, how are you? Good, thank you. Good to see you. Um, I want to pick your brain this morning about a question that I get all the time, um, which is, you know, um, I've it, the scenario is this. I've been in the United States for like 20 years. I came in illegally, but I've never had any criminal issues. I've always paid my taxes. Um, and I've had the same employer for the last 15 years. Um, and they love me. I'm part of their family and they really want to help me get legal. Can they, can they do something to help me get my papers? Um, and so I hear this all the time and I want to hear from you about whether that can or cannot work for a person in that situation, an immigrant in that situation to be able to get lawful status. Um, but before we get into this topic, um, I want to remind viewers to hit subscribe to our YouTube channel because uh, we are going to be publishing updates and information on a weekly basis about immigration law and opportunities in the immigration law to be able to get uh, the security and opportunity that come with lawful status. So please hit subscribe and then I'm going to let you take it away, Matthew. So unfortunately, we'll start with bad news that in, in most of the, the situations that you described where someone has uh, entered and overstayed for 20 years or has uh, with or without a visa, there's uh, usually not a valid pathway based on employment uh, or investment um, to, you know, there, there's the, the waiver, or the the perdón process is difficult or not available. Uh, and so helping that employee who's great, who, um, you know, has no criminal history, um, that, that might be something that, that is worth immigration reform, um, whether or not we get it. Uh, but usually for an employment-based uh, status, the person has to be in valid status. And so we yeah. might get into it a little bit more, but certain cases, if, if someone's in a, a different temporary status, they might be able to leave and apply to return to the United States. But that's definitely scary for, for people to, to consider doing that. So you're saying if someone's here as maybe a student or a tourist or um, some other temporary status, what, what other kind of temporary status um, immigration visa or visas or statuses do you see? So sometimes I see it where uh, someone gets DACA before they turn 18. And so they haven't accrued unlawful presence uh, because they, they obtained DACA before or uh, before they turn 18. Um, or uh, someone was in valid status and they obtained TPS before they fell out of status and therefore avoided accruing unlawful presence in the United States. And so the, the default or the main uh, professional visa is called the H-1B. And so if it's a job that commonly requires a bachelor's degree that the person possesses, um, then this H-1B visa allows, uh, it allows for immigrant intent, meaning the, the past, uh, you know, being in the United States and, and DACA or TPS or overstaying the status, um, uh, as long as there's no uh, unlawful presence that triggers a, a three or a 10 year bar, um, there might be a way for that person to depart the United States, apply for the H-1B visa, and then come back in. But that needs to be carefully managed and discussed with an attorney before, you know, before going down that road. Yeah, definitely. That sounds like it would be uh, a scary, although potentially no more scary than going through the immigrant visa process that um, a lot of our clients do uh, when they're married to US citizens and they get a, a waiver, a provisional waiver if they have an, um, an unlawful entry or have overstayed a visa. Um, 
we have seen lots of that. Tell me more about the H-1B um, and what it requires. Yeah, so the, the, the H-1B visa, it's called the specialty occupation visa. And it requires that the occupation that the, the, the person or the, the job that the person is filling uh, commonly requires a bachelor's degree or the equivalent. And so actually construction manager is, is one that, that I, I see every now and then. Engineer uh, is, is a very common technique, uh, certain, uh, certain technical jobs, uh, specialist jobs uh, can qualify. Um, and that's something that, you know, you'd need to consult with a, a business immigration lawyer to, to look up, um, to compare with the job duties to what the U.S. Department of Labor um, provides uh, and indicates is common for the, the occupation in terms of whether or not a bachelor's degree is commonly required. And then on the individual side, the person, uh, the, the non-citizen must have the equivalent of a U.S. bachelor's degree, and I and that and that bachelor's degree qualifies them for the job. And so I mean, I emphasize equivalent because um, three years of relevant work experience equates to one year of bachelor's degree. So uh, we would we would get an equivalency for someone who has, say, an associate's degree a two-year degree and six years of, of work experience, we could get an equivalency to a bachelor's degree. Wow, that sounds complicated. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is immigration law. Um, so Pat, um, when a person is in the United States in some kind of status, TPS, DACA, or potentially something else, and they want to change to H-1B, um, they do need to leave the United States and apply at a consulate in order to get that visa. Is that correct? Yes, yes, generally so, because they're not in um, their their formal non-immigrant status is presumably expired. Um, and so they're in DACA, they're in TPS, uh, which is kind of a limbo status, as, as you know. And so... The, the process would be for, for the H-1B non-immigrant visa would be to get an approval from the government in the United States. And then on the basis of that approval, it's a petition filed by the employer, go to a U.S. consulate abroad. Um, and some people are anxious about that and reasonably so, but the benefit of the H-1B visa is, is that it allows this, this concept of immigrant intent. So, the, the fact that someone's a high risk to immigrate being on DACA or being on TPS um, does not, does not, it's not a basis to deny the H-1B. So the, the blood pressure is a lot lower with, with that. So how long does an H-1B last? How long does it give you status? So the initial approval for an H-1B visa is, is typically three years, and then it can be renewable in two-year increments, uh, but the maximum per period of time someone can be in H-1B status is six years, with some exceptions, uh, which are primarily if the company has sponsored the person for permanent residency and has finished certain steps before the fifth year of being in H-1B status. Okay, so if you are, if you do have H-1B status, you can then move on to become a permanent resident? Yes, the, the most common process for an H-1B uh, visa holder to transition to permanent residency um, takes about two years right now, uh, during which time they have to maintain their underlying status. It's called a PERM labor certification based immigrant petition and adjustment of status. Okay, and um, you said that takes about two years. Right now. Yeah. Um, with the pandemic. I, and in, that in the best allows time. for adjustment of status in the United States as well? Yes, yeah, so basically, you know, in the in the family-based immigration, you think about the I-130 petition. And so this would be, um, this would be the, you know, this process that I'm trying not to get into, it'd be too technical, but there's the petition and the adjustment of status that can go along with it. 
uh, once you're sufficiently far along in the process. It's filed by the employer rather than the family member. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So for these, um, you know, I mean, I've probably met thousands of very deserving immigrants who, you know, but for, you know, not having the opportunity or, or the means or whatever it was to have lawful status in the past, um, you know, have contributed greatly, they've paid taxes, they've been good employees, they've raised families. Um, nonetheless, if I'm understanding you correctly, the law simply does not um, include provisions for individuals in that situation. We've also had hundreds of clients probably who had successful businesses, um, some of them extremely successful. Um, I had one client who's um, been, you know, while in undocumented status was, you know, named one of um, the Food Channel's top five tacos in the country, like her, you know, her restaurant was featured in a um, number of different, you know, really important publications. So, but nonetheless, the, if I'm understanding you correctly, the, the immigration law simply does not allow for individuals in those circumstances to receive lawful status through an employer or uh, as an investor uh, or a business owner most of the time if they have an unlawful entry and or unlawful status. Generally no and and almost you know 99.9% .9 of the cases no and there's really just not a clear pathway that anyone would want to risk um, you know departing the United States applying for a waiver with their along with their case and, and risking uh, risking it. There's not the provisional waiver process that you can get on the family-based side. And it, it's it's frustrating. Um, you know, I think that if more people knew about this, that, you know, we might get immigration reform because you would think, uh, you know, generating millions of dollars for the economy or employing U.S. workers or doing all these things should be a basis for a clear pathway um, to, to, to legalize or, or correct the status. Um, and so if someone is already outside the United States, then that's where, you know, I would review and, and consider their economic and public interest bases for a waiver for certain immigration pathways. But for those that are already here in the United States, the risk of, of leaving and triggering a three or 10 year bar uh, relative to not a lot of data on success of these waivers um, it's, it's frankly not, not usually worth the risk. Yeah. So waivers do exist in the law. It's just that people are generally not approved for them. And there's a lot of risk involved in leaving and, um, potentially getting denied. Right. Yeah. Right. All right. Well, I appreciate getting that clarification. Um, I've had, uh, that question come up so many times and I have to tell people, you know, generally what I understand is that the answer is generally no, but I don't know exactly why, <laughs> other than the immigration law is awful um, in the United States. It's really, really- Sometimes, sometimes though, I think it's worthwhile because I'm, I'm always surprised by different fact patterns and, you know, between, you know, what I do with business and investor immigration and then what you do, there, there may be a way um, and to a lot of people, especially those that have, you know, they're generating significant revenues in the United States, um, they, they want to make sure they explore all possible options. And so um, I would say, you know, generally no, probably no, um, if someone's here in the United States and is overstayed and, or injured without inspection. But uh, sometimes to certain people, it's worth the peace of mind to know that they, you know, reviewed everything possible and confirmed no, unfortunately not. Absolutely. And, you know, like you said, there, um, while a lot of employees that I've spoken to, um, you know, came to me asking if their employer could help them, um, a lot of times, even though that answer is no, we nevertheless discover that potentially there could be a case for a U visa or for VAWA or for uh, another type of um, visa for crime victims. Sometimes, sometimes there is a strong um, case for cancellation of removal in case there's a, an arrest or detention by immigration. The 
person can be put at some ease knowing that they would have a very, very strong case in the immigration court if they ever were arrested and that, you know, they can't necessarily just be picked up and scooped up by immigration and deported, you know, immediately that once you have uh, ties in the United States and you have time in the United States that you do have some rights to be able to present your case in the immigration court. So those kinds of um, uh, cases, you know, often lead to something potentially, um, even if the employment based side isn't the way that they can do it. So I appreciate you taking time to share all of this with me, uh, Matthew, and I look forward to talking more about the kinds of cases that um, that do work and where people can come and um, and invest in the U.S. and contribute to our economy and our culture, um, you know, through employment and investment that is so important um, for the United States and God forbid it stop. Um, so <laughs> we, I really appreciate you and what you do. And thank you so much for taking the time to share with us today about this. Thank you. Talk to you soon.